Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're returning to the topic of the Psalms and their meaning. Now, a brief disclaimer before getting into this psalm. The psalms will be numbered differently in different translations of the Bible. This is a very, very old discrepancy, and to help clear things up, I'll be explaining what number the psalm has in the douay Reims Bible and in the Revised Standard Version. However, the episodes themselves will list psalm numbers as they're given in the douay Reims Bible. Sorry if this is confusing. Anyway, this is Psalm 64 in the douay Reims Bible, but Psalm 65 in the RSV. To the end. A psalm of David, the canticle of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, to the people of the captivity, when they began to go out. Of course, Jeremiah is the prophet Jeremiah, who warned the people of Israel to repent of their sins, and whose warnings were ignored, leading to Israel being conquered and its people hauled into slavery in Babylon. This is the captivity referred to here. David, of course, wasn't alive when that happened, and there's no evidence that he was granted any prophetic visions of the Babylonian exile, so this psalm was probably written by David, then later sung by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel during the time when the people of Israel were forced from their homeland. A hymn, O God, becometh thee in Sion, and a vow shall be paid to thee in Jerusalem. God is fully deserving of songs of worship and promises that are kept by the faithful. O oh, hear my prayer, all flesh shall come to thee. The words of the wicked have prevailed over us, and thou wilt pardon our transgressions. In the end, God will judge all evil and all human beings. Evildoers have used lies to harm us over and over, but God has the ability to save us by forgiving our own sins. Blessed is he whom thou hast chosen and taken to thee. He shall dwell in thy courts. We shall be filled with the good things of thy house. Holy is thy temple, wonderful in justice. People who are chosen by God to live in his presence in heaven are blessed and extremely fortunate. They're fully satisfied by everything that's good, in a pure and just place which is full of splendor. Hear us, O God our Savior, who art the hope of all the ends of the earth, and in the sea afar off. No matter where you travel, on sea or land, there is no ultimate source of hope aside from God. Thou who preparest the mountains by thy strength, being girded with power. God is so powerful that he even made the mountains themselves. Who troublest the depth of the sea, the noise of its waves. God can even disturb the waters of the ocean, as he did when he parted the Red Sea. The Gentiles shall be troubled, and they that dwell in the uttermost borders shall be afraid at thy signs. People who oppose God's will for his people will be afraid when they see the miracles that he performs on behalf of the faithful, just as the people of Egypt were when the plagues were brought against them. Thou shalt make the outgoings of the morning and of the evening to be joyful. Outgoings of the morning and the evening refers to people leaving their homes or their cities to do work, either in the morning or at night. This verse is saying that the work of people is more joyful when they have God to rely on. Thou hast visited the earth, and hast plentifully watered it. Thou hast many ways enriched it. The river of God is filled with water. Thou hast prepared their food, for so is its preparation. Fill up plentifully the streams thereof, multiply its fruits. It shall spring up and rejoice in its showers. Throughout human history, one of the powers the people have longed for more than any other is the making of rain. A drought is one of the biggest disasters that a community can face, causing crops to fail, which results in both hunger and thirst on a scale that grows larger the longer the drought persists. This verse thanks God for bringing water as both rain to feed the crops and in freshwater rivers as well, which can also be used to water plants needed for food or gathered for other purposes. God is asked to continue providing plenty of this water, so that the land will bear plenty of fruits for people to eat. Thou shalt bless the crown of the year of thy goodness, and thy field shall be filled with plenty. Because of his command over the forces of nature, God never experiences famine in his own kingdom in heaven. The beautiful places of the wilderness shall grow fat, and the hills shall be girded about with joy. Everywhere in heaven, even where nothing is planted or raised, there's never any hunger or thirst, and every living thing there experiences more than they need, as in the Gospels, where everyone was filled with twelve baskets left over. What could be more beautiful than that? The rams of the flock are clothed, 
and the vales shall abound with corn. They shall shout, yea, they shall sing a hymn. Rams were covered in wool like sheep, and in heaven they'll be able to produce whatever wool is needed. Vales are valleys, places that don't get as much sunshine as a plain or a hilltop, so it's a little harder to grow things there, but that won't matter in heaven, where even valleys will be full of growing corn for people to eat. People will be so glad that they'll shout and sing songs of praise and happiness. This is a psalm of pure praise, with every word being devoted to appreciating something that God does, has done, will do, or is, or to appreciating the great benefits that God brings to those who are close to him. Because its subject matter is the highest possible, God himself, that also makes this the highest possible type of psalm. And I have to admit, I find it a lot more motivating than most on a purely personal level. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.